in northwest Edinburgh, Cramond village sits on the bank of the River Almond where it flows into the Forth. Though access is limited by the tide, the harbour is well used during the boating season. Cramond's origins date back to Roman times when the area was occupied by the Romans in mid-2nd and early 3rd centuries AD. Near the harbour is Cramond Kirk, built in 1665 on the site of a Roman fort. Remains of the fort buildings have been excavated over many years. On Friday the 17th of January 1997, inquisitive onlookers were gathered at the ferry boarding point. They had heard that an important statue dating from Roman times had been found and that archaeologists intended to recover it over the weekend. Journalists and photographers had been alerted and were busy gathering as much information as possible about the discovery. At first, the find, which was very close to the ferry boarding point, was hidden from view by a protective plastic cover. When no work could be done because of the tide, a watchful eye was kept on the site. Reports of the activities appeared in Saturday morning's papers, drawing crowds of people to the site. When the sculpture was finally uncovered, it was seen to depict a crouching lioness holding a human head in its jaws. The base of the statue, broken into two parts, lay close to the lioness. The lioness is thought to date from the time of the second Roman invasion in the early 3rd century AD. The statue was found by the Cramond ferryman, who noticed that changes in the riverbed had uncovered a carved stone, which he at first thought was an old garden ornament. After closer examination, he realised his find's possible importance. He officially reported his discovery, and recovery work was started immediately. Work continued during daylight hours over the weekend, only interrupted by the state of the tide. On Monday the 20th of January, when the final removal took place, floodlights were necessary to complete the work in the early winter darkness. The two parts of the base were hoisted onto the removal vehicle. The one-ton body of the lioness was strong enough to be lifted using a simple sling. When this had been fitted, and to cheers from the watching crowd, 
It was carefully raised from its 1800-year-old resting place. Then, very gently, it was lowered onto the lorry platform, ready to go to the National Museum's conservation facility. The newspapers kept the story going for about a week after the find. There was much speculation about the reward money for the ferryman. A counterclaimant was also found, though that claim was soon dismissed. So where is the lioness now? This is the, the wonderful uh, lioness sculpture from Cramond, found in 1997. Uh, this is her after having undergone an extensive conservation treatment. And what we have is one of the most important Roman sculptures from Britain. She's carved from a single block of white sandstone and you can still see the lines of the bedding planes from the original deposition of the sandstone hundreds of millions of years ago. And it's not a local kind of sandstone, it must have been imported from some distance away. What it shows is a Roman funerary monument and it contains a complex story within its sculpture. The main thing obviously is the lioness herself and here we have the wonderfully depicted sculpture, the power of the paws, the detail even of the claws and the teats and she's depicted pouncing on her prey and this is a standard piece of Roman iconography, the idea of the beast of prey going after its prey, it's the idea of the power of death, the death will get you in the end. A bit of a morbid story, but one the Romans were, were quite keen on. But this is more complex than that, because there's two other elements to the picture. One is the prey, because normally the prey in these things is a, an animal, a domestic animal, a goat or a sheep or a calf, but not here. In Cramond, the prey is a human. And it's not just any old human, it's a barbarian, a local, somebody who's been defeated in the, in the wars in the north. And we can tell that by the beard, which is typical for barbarians at this time in the second century, and also the fact that his hands are bound behind his back. He's a captive. So a death monument, but also a victory monument commemorating the deceased's place in the conquest of this part of Scotland. And the final element is these curving elements on either side, for these are snakes. Now, in the Christian world, snakes get the bad press, you know, for deceiving Adam and Eve, but in the Roman world, snakes were the good guys. The snakes were seen as being the survival of the soul. The, the snake indicates the survival of the soul. So the message is, death will get you, but the soul will survive. And at the same time, we beat the barbarians. It conveys this impression of the power of the animal. But up at the front it all becomes different, it all becomes magnified, it becomes almost monstrous. It emphasises the claws and the teeth, the jaw is distorted to fit round the head. And here we see not naturalism but monstrosity. And it's the idea here I think of, of pre-existing Iron Age beliefs, almost of Celtic beliefs coming through into this Roman sculpture. Because in the complex culture of the provinces you have a mixture of Roman and Iron Age beliefs and that's what we're seeing with the Cramond Lioness.